Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who will be talking about the good and evil in the land of avatars. In 1999, Philip Rosedale founded Linden Lab and built a virtual civilization called Second Life, creating an open-ended, internet-connected virtual world. In 2013, he founded High Fidelity with a mission to serve humanity by building technology that helps people be together in the most natural way possible from anywhere in the world. Please join me in welcoming someone who knows the meaning of rock and roll to the stage, Philip Rosedale. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello, hello, hello. I can barely see you all. So, uh, good and evil in avatars. Uh, well, it, thanks for having me. It feels like there's uh, a lot to talk about and not a lot of time. Um, this, this kind of binary talk title <laughs> it isn't meant to suggest that there uh, are easy answers to all this stuff or even easy categories to put things in, but rather to uh, invite us to consider that we are at a rather remarkable time in history where we, through our technology choices, can choose different directions for our collective future. And, you know, tech, uh, specifically the tech of virtual worlds and now AI has great power and great responsibility. A, a fellow entrepreneur, Will Marshall, whose company launches uh, satellites into low Earth orbit, uh, put it really well. We were talking about this. He, he said that software engineering, as compared to physics or other kinds of engineering, hasn't yet had its Hiroshima or its Chernobyl. I think that really, really sums it up. I mean, if you asked a, a promising young civil engineer to build a bridge for you using some fascinating new design that was really interesting and you know might attract fame and fortune but also had a real probability that it would collapse and kill people she wouldn't do it she wouldn't build it and that wouldn't be because of incentive systems or law or regulation. It's because she just wouldn't do it for you. And I think that's something to really think about at this moment in history as entrepreneurs and software developers who are building, such an uh, building at such an important moment in history. There also should be things that we just won't do. So, um, so Second Life, the, the virtual world that, that I started, uh, turns 20 years old this month, which is pretty unbelievable. I can't see that. I can't see you guys too well. These lights are so bright. But like, how many people? How many people out there? Well, there's only not too many people here. But use Second Life. Use Second Life. Cool. Met an met an important friend there who's still a big part of your life. How about made money? Made money. Cool. So uh, a lot of my ideas and insights come from Second Life, so let me explain it a little bit. Um, since some of you may not have been there and know what it is. So it's a virtual place. So as a virtual, literal, kind of physical space, Second Life's actually about the size of Los Angeles. And it is simulated continuously, 24 hours a day, on about 27,000 different servers, each of which handles about 16 acres of the virtual world. So, it's a fascinating thing. It's a fascinating thing from a cloud perspective, from a software perspective. About a million people live there. Um, and probably right now, there's like 50,000 people that are online. So, and, and then for several thousand of those people that are online, um, Second Life is their main income source. And every year, people in Second Life take out, you know, to pay for their, their, their lives, about $100 million from the virtual currency into the real world. About a million transactions between people happen there every day uh, in the local currency of Second Life called the Linden Dollar, and the average transaction is about two bucks. Um, so that's kind of a, you know, what is it? But after exploding, exploding into an unbelievable media hype cycle around 2006, Second Life leveled off in size and, and curiously has stayed around the same size ever since, this city of a million people. Um, so it isn't yet for everyone, and neither more broadly, I think, are virtual worlds. And I'm going to talk about that in, in more detail. Um, but in contrast to many of the more negative aspects of social media today, uh, it has been a remarkably positive experience for people. And so I want to talk about that, too. And I, and I deeply believe that online experiences at any scale 
at any scale, even with billions of people involved in them, can be positive in the same way, but we have to make the right decisions about that. Um, and specifically, I think that, by the way, that if Second Life, as it stands today, like instantly grew by a factor of, say, 100 or 1,000, it, it actually would work largely the same way. So it's, it's, I'm going to defend that it's also not the case that just if things are big or reach everyone, that they have to be bad in some way. That's just not true. Um, so in terms of, so that's the background. That's where I come from thinking about all this stuff. Um, but uh, in terms of fun stuff to talk about today and, and you know, kind of trying to speculate about where this is all going, having seen 20 years of Second Life, let's start with that Apple thing that's coming next week, right? Um, for the last 10 years, I worked with a couple of co-founders and about 100 teammates and friends on trying to use VR devices to, uh, uh, to, to bring uh, the virtual world experience to, to VR headsets. And it's been a, and it, quite an interesting experience, and I learned a lot about it. And so the big question is, are we about to see everything change in a billion of us using, you know, face toasters, as some people have called them? Uh, so l let me speak to that. In short, I think the answer is no. And we'll see what happens next week, but let me, let me, let me take that one on. Um, what are... So first of all, let's just look at the easy stuff. Char let's charitably imagine that Apple, of course, being Apple, does some great work and hits it out of the park here. So what are the easy things that can get fixed about VR devices for us? One is that they're not too heavy on the bridge of your nose. If you put the battery in your pocket or whatever's going to happen there, uh, yeah, you might be able to make a high-res display that's, imp that's not too heavy on your nose. This is important because most of us can't handle the weight of these devices for more than like 30 minutes. And what that means, which is really important, because this is what my work is all about, you can't have a meaningful social interaction with somebody in less than 30 minutes. You can't meet somebody new, you can't come to trust someone. So having something you could wear for more than 30 minutes would be awesome. The other one is obviously like reading your phone. I know as VR users we all would laugh about that. I mean, you can't read your phone. You got to imagine that Apple's going to fix that since they're in the phone business. Um, the other one is you got to be able to type at full speed. Um, the idea of like brain-computer interfaces is a far-off fantasy. We're not going to have that. If you can't type at normal speeds, use language, as many people are talking about now with AI, uh, you're not going to be able to have an alternative to, say, a screen. But I think that might happen. The fourth kind of, uh, this one's tougher, is nobody throws up anymore. <laughs> it's hilarious to think that we work in an industry where we're making devices that literally make people physically ill. Um, and have to deal with that as one of the features of them. I, I think actually making people sick, and my background's in physics, and I love the whole neurophysiology of this stuff, I think not making people sick is actually a really, really hard problem. So it, it's, it's going to be tricky. Um, but e imagining that Apple fixes those four things, let's get to the really, really hard stuff that I think I've learned uniquely from my work, both in Second Life and, and, and more relevant to headsets and high fidelity. The first is you got to feel safe when you're using these devices. And blinding yourself in a room with other people does not feel safe. And the big problem with that is that different people feel more or less safe because of that. Everybody feels a little unsafe. I always ask people, what was the, you know, what's your most fun VR thing and how was it the third time you used it? And then they're like, I never used it a third time. And it's because even though the experience is transformative and unbelievable of, of using a VR a headset, uh, it, it, it creates this sense, this lack of safety. And that lack of safety is a really serious problem because it causes a bias in the people that are willing to use these devices. And so the people that are wearing VR devices are not evenly distributed across, across humanity. And that's a really hard one to fix. I don't know how we do that. Maybe a dial on the side that makes it easier to transition between reality and virtual reality, but I'm not sure. And then the second one, which relates both to screen-based virtual worlds and uh, VR-based virtual worlds, is nonverbal communication. Unfortunately, a lot of the people that work in the VR space are less sensitive to nonverbal communication than, than most people. And this is a really big challenge. And the example I always give is we've all seen those Facebook videos of using Horizons to go to like a meeting. VR headset worn to, to go to a meeting. Now imagine that you're giving a talk in that meeting and your boss quietly walks in while you're giving your presentation like I am and she sits down 
in the room as an avatar and watches you. Do you feel that you could understand enough of the critical body language you need to see to know if you're doing a good job from her with a VR headset on? No way. No way. We see videos that suggest that, and all of us that are professionals working in this field know that we're absolutely not there yet on that. So I believe that nonverbal communication and the conveying nonverbal expression, for example, leaning forward, which is my, one of my favorites, in a way that actually is detected by the devices, is absolutely critical to getting us over the tipping point and into a billion people using uh, VR like the way they use smartphones, or AR, or XR. So I think it's really, really important that we fix this problem of nonverbal communication. So kind of at that, so that's the problem with the VR devices. That's my, that's my thoughts on next week. Let's see what happens. Um, but let's shift over now to screens, right? Forget about the, you know, the, the fever dream of the VR headset, right? But, but are we ready to be using virtual worlds amongst billions of people on screens either? And let me tell you what I think the challenges are with that. Again, Second Life leveled off at a million people. We don't have a lot of examples yet of any sort of social engaged experiences with, large, with a large number of people in them. In fact, the big, the big interesting thing to think about as we build these virtual worlds is that right now, the only people using, or, or the vast, vast majority of people using social virtual worlds are little kids. The, the people that are generating all the usage that we're talking about are kids, mostly between the ages of about 8 and 14. Roblox, Rec Room, Minecraft, Fortnite. And people over the age of 14, um, they don't stop using computers, but they do stop using social virtual worlds, which is really, really fascinating. And yes, of course, there are amazing exceptions with, with lots of adult usage, like VR chat or like Second Life, but they're a rounding error compared to, to the, the willingness of kids to go into these virtual worlds as avatars. So this is something like really interesting to think about. And as somebody who's worked on it my entire career at this point, I don't understand it yet, but we should all be thinking about it. Kids are using it and adults aren't. Oh, and by the way, Gen Z kids, as they're growing up, they're not continuing to use social worlds as avatars because otherwise we'd see phenomena like we'd see Roblox already shifting to be 22-year-olds, 25-year-olds using it. We're actually not seeing that. So that's challenging. One of the subtle things about all virtual worlds that I learned, so when I was talking to you, and I've been here many times talking to you, when I was, when I was talking about Second Life in like 2006, there was one thing I really believed that I, I think I was wrong about in retrospect, which was that we could all be both our human selves and then also an avatar. A great expression that I heard, uh, somebody told me a story about Steven Spielberg seeing virtual worlds for the first time, probably during the, you know, getting ready for Ready Player One. And apparently, uh, what he said, he looked at, you know, the, probably the third person avatar, Second Life or something, you know, standing in a place, and he said, there are too many me's. And I thought that was, that was really interesting. There are too many me's. There are too many me's. Um, and I think one of the things that we've learned from, uh, from Second Life is that many of the people that are in Second Life that are living there, as I would not say by, by comparison I live there, the people that are living there have a, share a really unique willingness to basically leave their real lives largely behind and concentrate their identity formation on their Second Life, on their avatar. I think this is a profound uh, challenge. I think somehow if we choose to live like multiple, as, as multiple avatars, our physical selves and maybe a couple of avatars, what we get is, in, for many people, for most people, less than the sum of the parts, right? Like the square root or something. So there's something that's hard about being two people at once or living two lives. And I think that is really interesting to be thinking about as we build this thing. Um, but given these challenges, there's a question to be had, which is, if we could overcome these obstacles with the VR headsets or with the virtual worlds, do we want to? Is it a good thing to go into virtual worlds, right? And to that, I think the answer is unquestionably yes. The right kind of virtual world, the right kind with the right decisions made, can bring us together, can bring us together and give us new ways of connecting deeply with people 
most importantly with people we didn't know before and creating trust with them. And that use of technology is precisely what we must at this important moment in history be thinking about, creating connections and trust with other people. In fact, it's important to back up and note that in the real world, most of the time, we are helpful and collaborative with other people, even when they're strangers, just like at a conference like this. A tiny percentage of people will do really bad things that then have a lot of impact, and we get confused and think that we're all bad. Social media companies actually sometimes do a really gross thing, which is they blame social media on us. They say that social, people are bad on social media because we're bad as people. There's just, it's just absolutely not true. There's just tons of research, and we all know anecdotally, that everybody's good most of the time. So the good news is, if we can just make virtual worlds similar in, in enough right ways to the real world, we won't be, we'll, we'll be good to each other in virtual worlds, just like we're good to each other in the real world. So let me talk to you about some of the things that I think you can do, we can do as builders to, to, make, to, make, to make the virtual world in the right way, like the real world. The first one is peripersonal space. Everybody that's worked on VR knows what I'm doing here with my hands, right? This is the distance where if you're closer to me than my fingertips, we're, we can touch each other. We can reach out and touch each other. And being in somebody's peripersonal space activates your brain in this way that we can even see in fMRI scanners. We know when you think that somebody's close to you. And when you think that somebody's within arm's reach of you, you act differently toward them. You act better. You're more present. You're more attentive. You act great when you're near somebody. And here's the good news. Dolls do that as well, and avatars certainly do. So seeing your avatar near, within arm's reach of somebody else, causes you to behave very differently toward them as compared to, say, the asynchronous interactions on social media, right? And, and if you think about design of virtual worlds, we can achieve this design by making virtual worlds mostly allow us to interact with people that we're close to, not people that we're further away. So imagine a virtual world that doesn't have direct messages and doesn't have guns, doesn't have a way to interact with people that you're not right in front of. Another one that's less obvious is sharing a common space, and this one is nuanced because you can make mistakes about this. When you see your avatar sharing the same room with somebody else, you establish a bond with that person. This is one of the reasons why Zoom is so miserable, because behind each person in the Zoom view most of the time, you're seeing a different room that you're not in, and this immediately makes you think that they're alien to you in some way that they're really not. So Motive, showing people the same space is important, but it's easy to get wrong because you can do things like we've already seen in products like selective blocking, also a bad Black Mirror episode, where I decide who I don't want to see and then somebody else decides who they don't want to see, and now we're all basically starting to live in a world that we're constructing, but the worlds aren't the same world. I think David from Croquet was saying this in his last talk as well, that it's very important that the worlds be the same, and so I think that's a really important thing that we can do right in our design. Another one, I mentioned trust earlier, web of trust, web of trust, web of trust. So even if you don't know somebody's real identity as an avatar, you could know, and with an AR device, this could be floating over their head, be pretty cool. You can know that the people that you trust, trust that person. And so if you need something, walk up to them and ask. You know, uh, If you want to meet somebody new, pick somebody that your friends already like, right? This idea of web of trust is something that I think is an example of technology, and technology specifically in virtual worlds used very, very right in terms of its impact. Um, some more things. In virtual worlds, we should engage in fair fighting, not in global moderation. This is a big deal. There's a lot of great thinking going on about this. Avatars need to be empowered not depowered, they need to be empowered in virtual worlds to settle almost all their conflicts locally. Calling the police needs to happen as infrequently in virtual worlds as it does in the real world. And right now we're calling the police, is that it's only in many virtual worlds, the only thing we can do is file a report and tell the police about it. It can't work that way. People should, for example, people should be able to leave an interaction with somebody without being followed or stalked, but you also need to have a stable pseudonymous identity, as you do, for example, in Second Life, so that if you come back at the end, or sorry, if you come back after a conflict, you still have to bear the consequences that may come of having started that problem. 
So this idea of empowering people. Another great example in Second Life is places in the virtual world are locally governed. So in Second Life, there's somebody that owns the restaurant that you're in, and then there's a community that owns the community. And you might get kicked out of those couple of places if you do something that's impolite. And that's specific to the place where you are. Um, also, more broadly, we need to create vibrant public commons in virtual worlds, not dead virtual shopping malls, right? We've demonstrated way too many of the latter. But what we need to have is spaces in VR that, where you could have a public debate, where you could have a political... Think, think about what it would take to build a virtual space that, that it allowed you to have a meaningful political town hall. Think about all the implications for identity um, and uh, interaction, how that would need to work. More broadly, there are rules for governing public commons. One of the, one of the, uh, one of the persons, one of the people whose work I wish I had read when I started Second Life, and I, but I read it later, is Eleanor Ostrom, who, who won the Nobel Prize explaining to everyone how the tragedy of the commons, that we all know the name of, the tragedy of the commons actually never, almost never occurs in real life. She got the Nobel Prize for sort of writing down the principles that cause it to not occur. We need to be reading those principles and designing virtual worlds because, again, going back to what I said, we can uh, make them work the same way as the real world. Fair economies. We need to build economies, currencies, mechanisms for trade in virtual worlds that enable, that reward creative efforts and enable fair trade between neighbors, not the sort of choke point capitalism that we've seen built already in so many areas. The reason that Second Life exploded, one of the big reasons I believe Second Life really exploded in popularity was that neighbors could buy and sell things from each other using Linda dollars. We did a bunch of weird stuff as a company, some of it just lucky, to enable that kind of a current, uh, an economy to exist. And in fact, um, in San Francisco, I'm, I'm starting, I've co-founded a, a new uh, community lab where we're working on both some XR projects and also some digital currency projects. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, Come find me. Um, surveillance advertising. I am a broken record on this, but we cannot move the idea of selling people's information to advertisers or to anyone or to politicians or whatever. We can't move that into virtual worlds. We've already seen what it does in the real world. We can't do it in virtual worlds. It's way too harmful. You don't know where the ads are. You don't know how you're being manipulated. It's an asymmetry problem that we can't play around with. Um, and we don't need to. Second Life makes more money per person as a free service with some fees, some optional fees, than Google or Facebook do per person in advertising. The idea that you have to have an advertising business to have a free service, total nonsense. We're just being fooled by a couple of companies that say that's necessary. It's absolutely not. Build virtual worlds based on fees. AI, last thought. Obviously, AI is like such a big deal right now. And there's obviously so many more things we could talk about it, but two important crossovers with virtual worlds. One, the opportunity to create 3D worlds directly from text. I'm one of the advisors to and helped with uh, the project called Mid Journey that you probably all know or many people know. Um, more than anything else, it enables people who don't know how to paint to talk or to write text and paint and create art. Imagine, obviously, how that applies to 3D. We all know that creating 3D art is much, much harder even than painting. And so being able to do text to 3D is going to be just explosive in its impact. And I do think we're going to see that like very soon. I mean, we're already seeing early demos, but I think we're going to see really gorgeous 3D stuff generated by AI. And that'll be incredible. The second darker side of AI is this danger of AI in virtual worlds, of AI taking us away from ourselves. If we leave... Uh, if we lose contact with each other, if we communicate less with each other, if we create fake friends that are nicer to us than our real friends are, or boyfriends or girlfriends, we're in tremendous danger of widening the gulf, the gaps that we have between ourselves and the real world. But we don't need to do that. For example, AI, we could have AIs that are therapists that help us uh, learn how to be better communicators. But this is the most dangerous decision, and if there was one takeaway you know, from the talk to say, think about this, uh, it, that's the one I would give you, is think about how we use AI to bring us together and not apart, because it, that's a tough one. I don't see exactly how we do it. So, in closing, um, I, I hope, 
I hope through all this I've given you as designers, those of you who are, at least you know, one concrete idea to work on. Um, I do think virtual worlds can take us in a wonderful new direction, but I think it's hard. I've worked on it for 30 years now. I can't believe that. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm, I'm building a new lab in San Francisco working on both XR and some other uh, uses of tech for good. And if that's where your heart is, um, seek me out and uh, um, I'll be around this afternoon as well. And thank you very much. Thanks.